Hey everybody, so in this lecture we're going to talk about trends in wildland recreation and we're going to talk about a few specific things. Um, specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and outdoor recreation and basically the big boom that had happened um, during the kind of height of the pandemic. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about whether or not that still is existing now. Um, we're also going to talk about just how to use social science broadly to understand wildland and wilderness users. Um, and some of their perceptions over time. This is could also uh, could be and has been applied to urban contexts as well. Um, and we're going to also talk about trends and wildland impacts um, and kind of typically what happens over time um, and the trends that are um, kind of happening. Um, we'll talk about trails and campsites there. So first things first, let's talk really briefly about COVID-19 and outdoor recreation. Um, you know, the COVID pandemic started, um, you know, in uh, earnest, if that's the right way of saying it, in March 2020. Um, and then that summer after um, afterwards, there was a huge increase in um, outdoor recreation. Um, it's a large part because of COVID-19, right? Like a lot of places were closed. Um, people wanted to get outside. Um, you know, folks were working remotely. Um, and there was a big kind of shift in outdoor recreational use um, across the US um, and across other places too, like Oslo, Norway. Um, and there was this big increase in outdoor recreation. And there was a lot of fear um, that those big increases would cause a lot of recreational impacts, um, which, you know, undoubtedly they did in certain places. Um, and there was also questions about whether or not those increases in use would persist over time. Um, it turns out that it seems to be waning a little bit now that it's been um, a few years uh, since March 2020 when um, the lockdowns kind of started and things were shutting down and were shut down for a while. Um, so that's just kind of what I wanted us to think about here is that these big kind of international events, uh, this is a unique one, right, um, can really impact outdoor recreation in a very meaningful way. Um, and it, it did uh, for a short period of time. And we'll kind of figure out over the next decade or so, like what the long-term impacts were of COVID-19 on outdoor recreation. Um, and yeah, um, other like organizations kind of popped up um, out of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, one is called Recreate Responsibly um, and they have state chapters. I know there's one in Oregon, there's one in California, there's others. Um, across the country, not in every state, um, but a handful of states have them. Um, and at the time, there was a big, uh, you know, push to recreate responsibly in the context of COVID, um, but also um, to practice things like leave no trace ethics, to build an inclusive outdoors and be welcoming of um, communities that traditionally hadn't used um, the outdoors in, in ways that um, kind of dominant user groups had in the past. Um, so we're thinking marginalized groups um, from urban and rural areas um, who were getting outside um, in particular places, not necessarily for the first time, but um, but we're getting outside. Um, so the things like, you know, know before you go, like is a place closed or open when you're there, practice social distancing, plan ahead, you know, get food and everything, have a mask so you don't have to go to a store um, to buy food, um, you know, play it easy, like this was going an easy trail to... Um, you know, prevent injuries and the need for like search and rescue or whatever else to kind of prevent, um, you know, uh, first person contact, explore locally that was, you know, don't spread germs um, across different places in the country or state. Um, and then these last two, again, are kind of more general things, but, you know, leaving uh, no trace. Um, and also, like I mentioned before, building an inclusive outdoors. Um, kind of interesting things, I think, um, that, you know, could over time um, have impacted and could still impact um, the way people recreate um, in kind of meaningful ways. And it's going to be, it is interesting to see some of the research coming out now, and it will be really interesting in the future to kind of see what this big pandemic event did to um, outdoor recreation. Um, in what wildland and wilderness users, um, you know, we can use social science. So things like social psychology, anthropological methods, interviewing focus groups, surveys, um, to understand wilderness and wildland users. We can also understand, you know, urban park users, suburban park users, rock climb, like specific user groups like rock climbers, horseback riders, surfers, whatever else. Um, but in a wilderness context, in a wildland context, 
Um, there have been on-site surveys, national surveys, interviews, focus groups, um, folks bringing diaries of wildland wilderness experiences or wildland recreation experiences. You know, you can use a GoPro camera to do video vlogs um, and then analyze those data. Um, you could, you know, you could do a variety of different things to kind of understand wilderness users. Um, so there's a variety of research that's out there um, that is old and new, right? So um, there's work on ex past experience and how that impacts people's behaviors among wilderness users. Um, there's different ways or ways of thinking about measuring the quality of the wilderness experience. This is qualitative work. Um, and then, um, you know, there's work on uh, just wilderness campers, perceptions and evaluations of campsite impacts. So whether or not they care about the impacts that we've talked about in this class, things like barren core um, or, uh, or erosion, um, changes in vegetation and whatnot. Um, all of these methods um, can be applied again in urban contexts. Um, you know, you could imagine um, they're using uh, qualitative methods to help inform the design of measures to um, quantify the experience um, in particular places. So the place like Golden Gate National Recreation Area, part of which is in an urban context. Um, you could use this in Portland parks, Portland, Oregon parks, um, Bend, Oregon parks. You could use it um, to evaluate rock climbers experience of rock climbing in New Paltz, um, New York, right? Um, a variety of different things that you can do here. Um, and you could, like if we want to use the rock climber uh, example in uh, New Paltz, uh, you know, we can think about um, rock, like, you know, replace this title with rock climbers perception and evaluation of um, impacts of rock climbing or something like that. I don't know. Um, and, you know, that is really useful to managers. It could be useful to um, a variety of different uh, groups to apply those um, those findings to, you know, like real world management situations, right? So thinking about this slide and thinking about what we're thinking, talking about here, really, this is all about like, how do we, this is just me kind of saying that we can use social science to understand these users. Um, and there's a lot of work out there on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the class goes on. Um, some of the takeaways from studies in wilderness areas in particular, um, first, you know, it's like not all wilderness areas are alike, right? So, um, you know, the data from one wilderness area on, on users might look a lot different than another place. Um, people might be really satisfied with their wilderness experience over time at a place like, I don't know, the wilderness in Yosemite. Um, and it might not look as, um, uh, that it might be less consistent in a place like the saguaro wilderness outside of Tucson, um, you know, making that up, but, um, you know, not all wildernesses are alike. Um, visitors have changed more um, than their visits, right? So the visits themselves kind of look the same, um, but more women are uh, involved in these um, in wilderness excursions than, than historically. Uh, more people of color are as well, um, although it still is, uh, you know, a relatively white male dominated um, space, um, but visitors and their characteristics um, and preferences have changed over time um, more than, uh, you know, like the actual, what the visits look like themselves. Um, the perception of impact conditions has basically not changed over time. So, you know, 20 years ago in the early 90s or the 80s, uh, people felt the same way about the impacts that they saw as folks see now, um, which is interesting, right, because there's more impacts now. Um, so that th there's kind of maybe a shifting baseline thing happening there. Um, and that's something that's kind of important to consider uh, as a manager um, and, and as we're kind of um, talking about the meanings of these uh, of these findings. Um, there's also, you know, inconsistent and declining attitudes, um, you know, towards um, a variety of different things uh, related to um, the experience and regarding agencies and whatnot, too. Um, and there are some management cautions to kind of take away from, right? So like the efficacy of revegetation um, is something that is important, right? Um, depending on where you're at, like revegetation and rehabilitation takes a lot and sometimes just isn't very successful. Um, so these are just kind of major takeaways. Um, you know, the book, uh, they're the reading, sorry for this week, kind of gets at some of these stuff. So I'll let you kind of explore that in more detail um, there. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about these major takeaways.
Um, so we're going to talk about trail impacts and um, campsite impact trends. Um, you know, with trails, right, there's really greater change with trails widening than increased trail depth. So typically trails will either um, widen or they will um, they will kind of uh, braid or whatnot as opposed to um, the trail depth increasing over time. Um, and, you know, this makes sense, right? I mean, there are certain sites, and again, it depends upon the soil type, the soil texture, it depends on the topography, all kinds of things. Like I've seen trails that are so um, so uh, impacted depth-wise that like they basically go to your waist. Um, like, uh, and that's, you know, that's right. So there are exa counter examples of this, um, but typically speaking, they get wider and there's more, uh, um, spire there's more braiding than anything else and you know trampling is the primary cause of widening um, and running water is the major cause of deepening um, and for depth really like the environment itself i was kind of getting at this before but like the soil texture water like that kind of stuff really makes a bigger difference than the use levels um, <clears throat> with mountain biking um, there's compaction but there's not really clear signs of trail widening there overall um, and this kind of makes sense right you think about how mountain bikers use trails um, and you know they're, they're typically staying on that single track um, and not uh, widening very much because they'll hit trees like this this guy uh, might hit I know I have been hit I was gonna say I've been hit by trees but that takes makes it more passive I've hit trees while I've mountain biked before and um, so I try to stay on that trail as well as I can um, stock, um, so horse stock, they cause severe trail damage to newly established sites, right? Which makes sense, uh, cause we think about horses as these, you know, several thousand pound, uh, animals with four shovels at the, the bottoms of their legs. So that's logical, right? Um, when we think about campsite impacts, um, impacts to established campsites, things like campsite expansion, mineral soil exposure, tree damage, that kind of stuff. Um, we see that, uh, we see mixed studies, uh, from results overall. Um, in terms of improving um, or changing, you know, some camp sites are going to improve over time, others are going to deteriorate, and others are going to remain stable. Depends on social ecological context, right? So again, as managers, you're going to know your sites really, really well. You're going to be the experts in your parks, in your forests, what have you. Um, and you are going to have, your job is going to be to like understand those social ecological contexts and the ways that um, certain places are impacted over time. And their capacity maybe to um, improve and you'll make management decisions based on your expert knowledge uh, coupled with um, you know, this empirical work um, because we wanna use best available scientific information in our management decisions. At high use sites, um, this is kind of talking about the mix of the, the results. At high use sites, um, you know, they either deteriorate or just remain stable. They don't really get better. Low use sites is just more variable and it depends upon um, the site itself. Okay, more on uh, campsite impact trends. Um, at new campsite, the impacts, um, we see things like site pioneering. This is that, you know, new campsites being created over time in other places, um, you know, becomes a ma major concern. Um, and trend-wise, campers are more likely to pioneer campsites now than compared to the 1970s. So that's a management concern um, for sure going forward. Okay, so that is um kind of what we are going to talk about um in this lecture uh, and um to just summarize you know we talked about COVID-19 um and you know some of its immediate impacts and maybe some of its tailing off of use uh we talked about using social science to understand users um and we also talked a little bit about the impact trends that are happening kind of over time um from a decade-long kind of perspective when it comes to trails and campsites um, so when we think about trends here, um, you know, again, like these big events can really change things and then, um, you know, maybe not have that big of an impact afterwards, something like COVID-19. Um, we can use social science to understand users over time, and we can use um, the methods that we're, we're learning um, in recreational ecology to really understand um, the trends of impacts over time. Um, so thank you, and please let me know if you have any questions.